On the 4th of September 2011, Indian filmmaker Jagmahan Mundra passed away. He was 62 years old. The news sent a shockwave through the Indian film industry, and his death was reported in key publications such as the Times of India and the Indian Express. It also made international headlines, with the likes of Screen Daily and Industry Bible Variety covering the story. However, in the ensuing obituaries, certain aspects of Mundra's long career seemed to be missing. While every outlet was happy to report on Mundra's acclaimed post-2000 film work in his native India, and a few others were willing to acknowledge the existence of Hako Lantern and the Jigsaw Murders, a pair of 80s video store staples that Mundra made in America, all overlooked the movies that earned Mundra cinematic infamy in the first place, those being the monumental spread of erotic thrillers that he crafted between 1990 and 1996. In brief, the 11 erotic thrillers that he made in America earned him a reputation as a pornographer. In the eyes of the mainstream, and even among those with more esoteric tastes, Mundra's night eyes to tainted love period was dirty and disreputable, despite the fact the bulk of these films were wildly successful in the home entertainment arena. Safe to say, it's these movies that we're going to look at today. As you may or may not know, we covered Mundra's trend-setting crotch opera, Night Eyes, and the series it spawned last episode. So here, it's the rest of them. The ten films that followed in Night Eyes' wake, but were all branded with the immortal words. A Jag Mundra film. <laughs> of schlock and all. Welcome to Flesh Noir, the home of the straight-to-video erotic thriller. Here are your hosts, Maddie Budrevich and Dave Wayne. Sex. Sex. Hello, and welcome to Flesh Noir, episode three of the direct-to-video erotic thriller podcast. My name is Dave Wayne, and sat to my right-hand side is Matty Budrevich. Hello. Jag Mundra. Mm-hmm. We need to crack on with this. We really, really. Sorry, I'm I'm sat here grinning like a maniac because this this is a big one. Like a Cheshire cat. <laughs> but we have to press on. A whopping ten movies to cover. Incredible. Where do we begin? Well, in order to understand Mundra, I think personally that we have to go back right to the start because there is so many things in his upbringing Mm -hmm. and in how he got into the film industry that play a factor later on in his career it's a a conservative upbringing isn't it yes very much so right mundra he grew up in a tough and very conservative household in the bylanes of calcutta right and it was a it was far from affluent. Mm-hmm. Mundra himself, he even said that him and his family, they were definitely, definitely, definitely on the lower end of the socio-economic spectrum while he was growing up. Mm-hmm. The household, it was steeped in tradition. And with very, very few exceptions, films were frowned upon. Right. Which, looking back, it's quite interesting, as, as we'll go on to explore, that a lot of Mundra's erotics, they deal with repressed characters mm. breaking free so. of their metaphorical shackles. Mm-hmm. Something which Mundra himself had hoped to do because he, as a child, he harboured a secret desire to become a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. But it didn't start that way because he had this this weird you know, engineering background. It was only films only happened when he came to America, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Because it, didn't he do a PhD in marketing of motion pictures? Yes, that's right. He, he studied electrical engineering right. at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Okay. Uh, and he was pursuing a master's degree in wow. that subject. Uh-huh. But as you say, he moved over to the US to continue his studies. And it was while he was studying at the University of Michigan mm-hmm. that he switched to a PhD film program because, well, you know, that's what he wanted to do. Sure. Mm-hmm. After that, mm-hmm. 
he was wanting to break into the film industry, so as a way to do that, he was working in tandem with being a teacher, because he was now a professor. Sure. He was operating a theatre in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, somewhere between all that, he managed to make a film called Surag, which was much publicised as it was the first Hindi-language movie mm. to be shot completely in the United States. Right. Off the back of that, he went on to make a film called Kamla mm-hmm. in 1984, which was a serious issue-minded film ripped straight from then-recent headlines in India, mm-hmm. and it was adapted from a play of the same name by India's leading playwright, a man by the name of Vijay Tendulkar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Kamla, it was about the existence of rural flesh markets, basically somewhere where you could buy women and slaves and the like. Yeah. Now... It received critical acclaim in India, but it wasn't a financial hit and it didn't have crossover appeal in the market where Mundra ultimately wanted to be as a movie maker, mm-hmm. which was, of course, his new adopted home, America. Yeah. Perversely, despite Surag and Kamla, you know, he, he'd made two movies, he could prove that he could direct, mm-hmm. but no American producer or investor was willing to touch Mundra as they were convinced that he could only make Hindi movies sure. and not American-style films. Yeah. So, after Kamla, in between trying to get several projects going, but to no success, Mundra, he returned to teaching... Uh, by day and worked as a shipping department clerk at a production company owned by a man called Sandy Cobb at night Mm. uh, with the hope of making some American contacts who could get something going for him stateside. Yeah. Uh, Now, it was while he was working one night where he came up with the idea for something called multiple listings, which he went on to describe as a commercially minded horror thriller. In the interim, Mundra, he'd struck up a friendship with one of the lasses who worked in Corb's office, and crucially, with Corb's daughter, who was the company's receptionist. And with their help, Mundra, he managed to get the script for multiple listings in front of Sandy Corb. Now, Corb, he offered Mundra $1,000 for the script, Hmm. but Mundra refused and said that Corb would have the script for free if he let Mundra direct it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now... Corb, again, even though he'd watched Mundra's two Hindi movies, he was reluctant to let Mundra (laughs) do it because, again, you don't know what American audiences want. Yeah. However, because of his daughter being friends with Mundra, she managed to get him to relent and Corb ultimately took a chance on him as director. So Mundra set about creating what would be his US debut. Mm -hmm. Uh, And multiple listings, it went before cameras before getting released as something called Open House in Mm -hmm. 1987. Mm -hmm. Now, while all this was happening, Mundra, he still felt he had to prove that he could make um, popular entertainment for the American marketplace. So post Open House, he he elected to craft another horror film to further prove to American producers and and investors that he had what it takes. Uh, And the film that he came up with there was a little slasher movie called Hack O' Lantern. During Hack O' Lantern, Mundra, he connected with a former tennis pro turned film producer who we mentioned last episode, Mm -hmm. Ashok Amritraj, who, like Mundra, was trying to prove a point of his own. Because where Mundra was trying to prove he could make these American genre movies and and get a career out of it. Amritraj, he was trying to work his way up the Hollywood ladder. He was sick and tired of taking meetings with various executives about what he thought would be a potential film project, but really, these chats just turned out to be ways for them to tap into his tennis background and try and teach him a bit of backhand and how (laughs) to serve and stuff. So, Amritraj, he had connected with Roger Corman, so he and Mundra went on to make The Jigsaw Murders and Eyewitness to Murders together, which Corman distributed, yeah. and which ultimately led them to meet Andrew Stevens. Mm-hmm. And so Stevens, Amritraj, and Mundra, as we explained last episode, got their little thinking caps on, and that's how they came up with Night Eyes. Mm-hmm. Night Eyes was a big success. But by the time their next film came around, Night Eyes hadn't been released. Mm-hmm. But still, they had a feeling, didn't they? They had mm-hmm. a feeling of what a trend they could establish. Mm -hmm. And as we covered in the last episode, you know, they had to find something that was economical to make and they could succeed by doing on a slim budget, but with relatively sparse, you know, sets and Mm -hmm. locations. 
And it was quite simple that the idea had to be an erotic thriller. However, what's interesting about the first two films Moondra would make, immediately post Night Eyes, is that they both straddle different divides. Yeah. So the first one that we're going to look at now, Last Call, that is very much in the Night Eyes mode. That is an erotic thriller. Whereas the second one, which was shot, what, a month or two after Last Call, a film called Legal Tender, Mm. that's much more in keeping with... Uh, jigsaw murders and eyewitness to murder in the sense that it's a standard thriller Mm. with a few sexy elements and that's purely because when both these movies went into production though they had a sneaking feeling that night eyes was going to do okay Mm. they couldn't completely bank upon it don't be so hard on yourself people get taken in all the time yeah well i'm not gonna let them get away with it i'm gonna do something i want to help you Yeah, it's not your problem. Maybe it is. No, wait a minute. What do you mean? You're going to need someone on the inside, right? I'm Jason's personal assistant. We can be partners. I want to help you nail Jason. It could get very dangerous. This man is crazy. Well, partner, we'll just have to make him crazier. Okay, so we're starting with one of the best, really, aren't we? Uh, Last Call, which is probably in most people's top five uh, Mm -hmm. Jack Moondra's films. Um, It started shooting on April 16th, 1990, uh, and wrapped five weeks later on May the 20th. Coincidentally, it finished shooting 11 days before Night Eyes would hit VHS. Mm -hmm. Interesting in terms of context. But, you know, nevertheless, they went with a similar kind of template to yes, the previous film. Yes, very much so. I do want to sort of prefigure this by saying that although when it was released on video, mm. uh, Last Call, it wasn't the mega book smash that Night Eyes no. turned mm-hmm. out to be, but I will say that for Amritraj as producer and Mundra as director, Last Call is artistically the superior erotic thriller. Yeah, uh, without doubt. Without doubt. But why is that? Because it's the first of Moondra's films that really exhibit what made him so special as a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, it's deliciously done as a whole. And it's just a complete and utter smorgasbord of all of his quirks and trademarks. Mm. So you've got things from the easygoing pacing and the flashes of sort of weirdness within the plotting to the droll humour and imaginatively conceived scenes of shagging. Well, yeah, that, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, I think one thing that, 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 that permeates all of Jack's films, and I think it's best for us to sort of comment upon this now before mm. we tackle the films, is that Jack didn't really linger on the mm. sex all that much. I mean, the sex is over quite quickly, something I'm quite familiar with myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, he didn't. It was more, everything was gauged more towards the thriller, the narrative exposition that Mm, kind of thing mm. and the sex was more incidental but as you say the the location of the sex is really really interesting and in this film what we got we've we've got um we've got a skylight sex scene Mm -hmm. uh we've got a a chair sex scene Mm -hmm. which is probably one of the best scenes he's ever shot we've we've got the first as well as what would quickly become one of Moondra's trademarks Mm. the sort of the a masterful single take sort of how the hell mm. does he do it kind of thing <laughs> and he'd use that a lot in subsequent films but here in Last Call it's this beautiful transition between uh, Shannon Tweed's character and William Cat's character mm. where they go from smooching to them passionately humping on the floor of her apartment <laughs> and it is really a really really striking mm. standout bravura moment because again yeah. it's done as one shot and it is seamless you have no i have no idea how they managed to do oh, it that's amazing yeah, yeah. yeah and again that sort of stylization is another key feature of Moondra's films and mm-hmm. it's no wonder that he would go on to recycle that sort of technique several more times throughout his career because it's such a breathtaking visual style yeah, let's talk about Shannon because in this film, really interesting character. Mm-hmm. She, she's using uh, a really realistic, realistic guy by the name of Paul Avery, isn't she? Mm-hmm. To try and exact some revenge on the person that's responsible for killing her mother. 
Mm-hmm. Now we know this because that's the way the film starts. Yeah, and we, we and she kind of has a double role, doesn't she? Briefly, she does. yeah, yeah. In, in a really interesting black and white sequence, does that work for you? That oh yeah, I, mm. I I love it. I mm. think that it's very very stylized. Yeah. The film it almost I can see why some people might argue unpalatably so. Right. Mm-hmm. Because initially, Last Call comes across as very very soapy and histrionic. Yeah. But that's just purely the nature of the flashback. It's done in a very stylized way, sort mm-hmm. of what, like how uh, Oliver Stone would go on to right. do the soap style for the Rodney Dangerfield bits <laughs> in Natural Born Killers. Yeah. It, it's done in that mindset. Mm. It's a, it's sort of one thing Moondra is very very good at is skewering certain aspects of American culture, and I think that he does that a lot. Before Last Call, you saw him do it in the Jigsaw Murders. Mm. which is where it's as if he's just absorbed every police procedural TV show cliche imaginable, put them into a blender and served it. And he does it in a way very much like Paul Verhoeven, whereby it's it's satirising American pop culture in a way that only a foreigner in America can do it. William Cowp plays an interesting character. He's kind of a noirish lead, but he's a bit too wholesome for that. Mm. Mm. Um, Yeah, but... He's he has a wonderful arc in this mm. film. One of the many things that that works is how he he goes from this mild mannered real estate guy <laughs> to a smooth, suave embezzler yeah. across the course of the film. And mm. it's all because basically, you know, he's been he's been pussy whipped by Shannon Tweed, and he's fallen madly in love with her, love exactly. and lust. And, I mean, she's an enigma um, initially in the film. You never really get a handle mm. on her. But then, of course, uh, she has this club sequence where she's clad in a fishnet body stocking uh, with a knife and writhing on a spider's web. And that kind of gives you a window into her character. Because mm, <laughs> she... It, it's a, her performance, it's this fascinating mix. Very, very complicated blend of mm. Girl Next Door. Yeah. Femme Fatale, of course. And almost an out-and-out goddess... You know, she like Moondra paints her as this formidable, dirty like creature that will just lure a man in to get what she wants. Yeah, yeah. But she's not she's not malicious or dangerous with it though, because you can see throughout the film that she does have ha- she does have genuine feelings for William Cat's character of Paul. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, and and you know, they do have they you know, I don't think it's any spoiler to say that they do get their happy ending. <laughs> in so to speak, than one. so to speak. But um she is phenomenal in mm. Last Call, and as important as the film is in terms of how it cements Moondra's obsession as a filmmaker, it is important to note that it marked the final step in Tweed's metamorphosis from B-movie starlet to the undisputed queen of the erotic thrillers straight to video wing. Yeah. Uh, an, an evolution that began with Don Carmody's The Surrogate mm-hmm, in 1984 mm-hmm. and extended to Nico Masterakis's In the Cold of the Night in 1990 before, again, it kicked in here. Mm-hmm. The bad guy in the film is is played by someone that we love mm-hmm. dearly, uh, the dearly departed Matt Rowe. Mm-hmm. Um, he's great in this and he, he could lend his hand to a variety of things. Screenwriter, actor. I mean, he, he popped up in some in some brilliant movies, didn't he? Yes, that's correct. He, he's generally best mm. remembers of the resident horn dog sure. in David Schmoller's Puppet Master, <laughs> where he was the ponytail Frank who gets mm. the iconic mm. death by uh, Leech Woman mm. during some kinky S and M shenanigans. Yeah, he though, he's brilliant at playing slimy pricks, <laughs> and it's a role that he would sort of return to many more times because Moondra cast him a lot. Yeah. Uh, even better still, and I'm sure we'll save this for later on, is mm. that Moondra used him as a scriptwriter as well. Yeah. Uh, and two of, the la- uh, two of the later movies in this episode came from the pen of Rowe and his writing partner. But again, just a masterclass in slimy, oily villainy. Just a truly despicable, skeevy creep who really does deserve what's coming for him. <laughs> uh, Last Call was released on VHS on February the 7th, 1991, in both an R-rated and an unrated cut, which was a familiar territory at the time, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Which is, yeah, uh, yeah. Which is intriguing. Um, but then again, Mundra always said he kind of... Um, he would make three versions of mm-hmm. each film, didn't he? Apparently so. Apparently yeah. so. All at the same time, yeah. obviously. 
you know, there was the, 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 the wide shot, which would go on inevitably on the unrated cut, mm-hmm. then slightly tighter for the R cut, and then for a market like Saudi Arabia or somewhere like that. Well, they where... could only have the, the implication <laughs> of sex. Yeah, then it'd be really, really tight. Yeah. Which, which is wonderful. It's great to think, we... that, it's great to think that Saudi Arabia would have a Jagmandra film. It's just a shame that the, the cut versions would likely rob you of the utterly joyous sight of William Katz's lily white ass bouncing <laughs> up and down as he pummels Shannon Tweed. Ricky! Flips! They just what? arrested Bud. What? They arrested Bud. What? What do you mean, Bud? For dealing. I'll go down to the station, see what I can do. Why, Bud? They should have nailed Bobby. Bobby's dead. Now, ten weeks later, we're starting to shoot Legal Tender, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Which, although it's got a lot of the same people doing it, you know, Armour Trash, etc., etc., Moondra, obviously, it's a very different ball game, isn't it? Yeah, it Why? is. Why? As I mentioned earlier, mm. when Legal Tender was being written, Night Eyes wasn't a dead cert. It had been finished, mm-hmm. it was in the can, but it yeah. wasn't released yet. Mm-hmm. So that's why they that, that's why Amritrage and Moondra created two movies. One, Last Call, mm-hmm. which again, Night Eyes mode. Two, Legal Tender, which harked back to the ones that we'd already mentioned, yeah. Jigsaw Murders, Eyewitness to Murder. Very much so, yeah. Legal Tender is very, very much just a conventional thriller mm-hmm. with a few racy elements. As far as skin goes, it is very, very light indeed. I think it's 42 minutes before we get the first yeah. proper yeah. sex scene. And even then, I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a bit of bare boob yeah. on show, yeah. Yeah. but the centrepiece, the mm-hmm. centrepiece love scene... <laughs> Which is very well done, yeah. say, but it's marred by the fact that instead of Tanya Roberts and her mm-hmm. grizzled co-star Robert Davy, mm. it's very obviously performed by a pair of body doubles. Really? Mm-hmm. I'm surprised you say that. I did, that did not occur to me. That in no way seems apparent in any way. Uh, it, but yeah, it, it's it's quite yeah. shockingly apparent. Yeah. Mm. Now, if we park Moondra for a second... Yeah. The big topic of conversation with Legal Tender, it rests upon Tanya Roberts. Mm-hmm. Obviously, she was in Night Eyes, going to be in a sanctum. And basically, for the first chunk of the 1990s, before the likes of Shannon Tweed and Shannon Wirry hit their stride, Tanya Roberts was seen as the empress of the erotic thrillers straight yeah. to video wing. Mm-hmm. Now, behind the scenes, the former Charlie's Angel, she was in no uncertain terms a complete and utter fucking nightmare. <laughs> so, she gave Fred Olin Ray the runaround on the set of Inner Sanctum. She repeatedly, famously, locked horns with Jim Wynorski during the shooting of Sins of Desire. Yeah. Uh, and she quickly earned a reputation among the B-movie community for being incredibly difficult to deal with mm, mm. telling me few directors worked with Robert more mm. than once but there were a couple of exceptions you had like Rob Sperrer Ellen Sycamore and Romy Hayes as the decade went on yeah. they did multi-episodes with her on um, Cinemax's anthology show Hotline oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but feature wise the only director to work with Tanya Roberts twice very close together as well, was Jag Moondra. He right. formed enough of a bond with her while making Night Eyes that her and her husband, Barry Roberts, mm. recruited him and Amritrage to bring a sort of vanity vehicle to life, that being, of course, legal tender. That was going to be my question. You know, how much of this is a vanity vehicle for Tanya Roberts and how much of it is a Jag, Jag Moondra film? Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I can see elements of Jag Moondra in it. But there's a lot of Tanya Roberts in it yes. too. I mean, you, you know, the film opens and it looks like she's dressed like Al Pacino in Cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> the the frustrating thing about Legal Tender is I I like it, but I don't like it. Mm, I like it mm. for what Moondra does because okay, yeah, yeah, from, from the Roberts perspective, I genuinely think that Tanya Roberts and her husband Barry mm. that they honestly believe that they've written a really compelling work of sure. human interest drama <laughs> when they haven't. No, no it's no, no. really hackneyed and stupid, and the script is awful. And Moondra, quite rightly, 
I think he knows that it's a bit of a lark, and he just proceeds to take the piss mm-hmm. with his direction. His direction is really, I'm in on the joke, look, I know this is kind of crummy, let's have fun with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, th- I think they're trying to edge into sort of noirish territory, but they don't really get there. Yeah. I mean, all the hints are there. You've got the picture of Bogart on the wall. Yeah, You've yeah. got Robert Davy as the, uh, as, as, the, as the private eye by the name of Fix Cleary, <laughs> which, which I love. Fix Cleary. Uh, although Fix is an acronym, isn't it? For Francis Ignatius Xavier. Yes. Uh, yeah, which probably makes sense. But either way, it's probably the most ridiculous name in any Jagmundra film that we... Uh, yeah, very toastish. Very toast of London. <laughs> uh, well, of course, Morton Downey Jr. is in this as well. Yes. His, his second yeah. uh, erotic thriller. Although this was done before Body Chemistry 2, was it? About the same time. Yeah. Um, I'd be hard, it, it'd be hard to pin an exact date yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he is great. And probably Morton Downey Jr. is certainly one of the key reasons for, yeah. for watching this. But although probably not for his skimpy... But you smuggle it. Well, just make sure you've eaten, quite frankly. Like, with it, the good, the, the thing with Morton Downey Jr. Mm. is that he's in on the joke as well with yeah. Moondra. Mm-hmm. So on one hand, you've got this really strong visual style from Moondra. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very, very playful. And he, and he does manage to find this consistently entertaining balance between the hackneyed grit and gristle of mm-hmm. the script mm-hmm. with these sort of tacky, sillier moments, which he does <laughs> rightly present as high camp. Yeah, like the spanking. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And that's something that Downey Jr. does. Sure. He mugs like nobody's business <laughs> throughout this. And he just has a complete and utter ball chewing the scenery as the film's villain, who's yeah. this sort of, what, a shady, in, a sh- shady bank guy who offers to try and save Tanya Roberts's bar from these drug dealers that it turns out that he's involved with. Yeah, what is it? Hearth and Home Savings and Loan? <laughs> with a soft, <laughs> soft portrait hanging in the office. And Lovely. he's obsessed with, with <laughs> cowboys. Yeah. As well. <laughs> but yeah, Downey Jr. and Moondra's waggish direction are yes. very much the highlights of Legal Tender. The rest, Legal Tender's supporting cast, they are meh. So if it wasn't for Moondra's playful tone, Downey Jr. gorging upon mm. the scenery, mm. um, and the beautiful photography from Moondra regular James Mavers. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, the, the film would be complete and utter pap. Not now. I've got to go to the paper. Well, in that case, I guess I better get back in the shower. I'm kidding. It's a joke. Paul, so if you don't get your way, you try sarcasm? Is that what you tell all those basket cases that read your books? No. I tell them to open up, to enjoy life, to let go, which is something that you haven't been able to do. That's the point of my book, remember? Greg, don't use me to practice for your goddamn book tour. Jesse. Jess. I think you... No. We need to see somebody. Talk about you and me. Stuff about your mother. So in the space of 12 months, Jag Mundra has shot Night Eyes, he's shot Last Call... And he shot Legal Tender. Mm-hmm. Maybe even 10 months. But he took a little bit of a break, didn't he? Um, not by choice. Mm-hmm. The long and short of it is this. Night Eyes comes out. Last Call, Legal Tender are in the can. When Night Eyes goes on to become a monstrous hit, Ashok Amritraj offers Moondra Night Eyes too. Right. However, he can't do that because he'd already agreed to make a film called Vishkanya over in India for a producer called uh, Sunil Perra. And by all accounts, it was a complete and utter disaster. Oh, right. Mundra later went on to describe it as a waste of six months of his life (laughs) where he just basically spent six months idling over in India Mm, mm, when he mm. could have been making movies over here. But now he's back. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's back into the erotic thriller game. Mm-hmm. But this time, he's working for Gregory Dark and Andrew Garoni, mm-hmm. which is a whole different ball game. Yes, it is. From yeah. the more sanitised erotica that he'd done before. You know, Gregory mm. Dark is renowned for his yeah. hardcore yeah. pornography. I, I, w- I wouldn't really call Moondra's... I mean, I wouldn't call Last Call sanitised. There's some real spicy stuff yeah. in there. Not, not maybe to the extent of... 
some of the later things that Moondra would shoot, mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. when he starts flirting with kinkier elements and stuff yeah. like that. But it's pretty, it, it it's vigorous and it's sexy. It's just maybe a little more playful, playful compared to what Gregory Dark had become right. known for. No, that's fair enough. I'd agree with that. Um, and we have the other woman, which would be mm-hmm. the first film he directed um, for Gregory Dark, uh, written by George Desazientes, um, who's the, one of their regular writers. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting little piece, and it introduces us to one of our favourite, favourite Jagmundra finds, which is a girl by the name of Liam Beeman. Mm-hmm. And she's brilliant, isn't she? Uh, girl from the Midwest, wasn't she? Yep, working um, as a stripper. Working as a when, stripper. When uh, yeah. Gregory Dark and Garoni discovered mm. her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she sort of had like a little breakout role in Mirror Images for That's Dark. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she would go on, she'd go on to appear in Dark Sins of the Night and become a real, real regular in uh, Moondra's rep company. Yeah. Uh, where she'd appear in what uh, improper conduct, mm-hmm. irresistible impulse, tainted love, and shades yeah. of grey. Yeah, and she's great. She carries this film because you know top billing may go to Adrian Smed, who we know for uh, T J Hooker, but he's barely in this, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And the film really is about Leanne or, or her character Jessica Matthews' sort of path of discovery, as you mentioned at the start of the show. You know, Mundra often dealt with slightly repressed characters, mm-hmm. and Jessica is certainly that type of girl, isn't she? Yes. You know, she's doubt. struggling with her, her husband. Her husband is, is 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 very successful. He's a big author, written ten books, but he's he's kind of horny, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, she, she's not really up for it. And then he, she kind of suspects him of having an affair, um, and goes in pursuit of, of this woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the name of Tracy Collins, played by Juliet Reed. And then we develop this story, this friendship between the two, and it really mm. opens her mind in regard to um, her own sexuality. Mm-hmm. There's two elements at play with the mm. other woman. It's maybe not so much an erotic thriller right. as it is an erotic drama. Mm. Um, however, the problem is that they, the film sort of... It, it's flaw is that narratively it's bookended mm. by thriller elements in the form of sure. Flash Gordon. Sorry, Sam Jones' character, <laughs> who appears in it. Now, you could you could take the Sam Jones character out of oh, this film doubt. and you'd still have a compelling erotic drama yeah. that's about a woman finding herself, mm-hmm. basically. And it's because of the thriller elements that another part of its flaw is that it's just, well, it's lumbered with this awful noirish narration. That yeah, it didn't that doesn't need. work so well. Yeah, yeah like, no, and, and and I think that's a bit of a misstep. Mm. Now, it, it's it's not major or anything like that. Neither really are the thriller elements at the end. It doesn't kill the fact that this is a very, very good movie. But if you were to be so gauche as giving it a star rating, mm. it's the difference between it having the three stars that yeah. it does for solid three stars and four stars mm-hmm. um, because it didn't need that narration no, it didn't no. need the thriller elements uh, and it would definitely be a lot stronger without it and it's almost as if both of them were added in post by either Moondra okay. or mm. other producers because they felt they needed to give it a bit more of a, a, a murderous and actiony hook yeah yeah but the sexual aspect is is, is... Very cool in this. It's interesting mm. to read about how Access um, always demanded a lesbian sequence. Mm-hmm. And I liked Mundra's twist on that, and that he was determined to make it interracial. Mm. Between the characters of Jessica and Trace, it was something you didn't really see very often. I remember writing a piece about um, the adult film world and how interracial porn was quite mm. um, uh, sneered upon. Um but here, I mean, it's done. It's done so well. But, well, there's there's two mm. lesbian scenes yeah. within the film. There's one where, well, it turns out that Beeman's character Jessica, that she was raised by a deeply, deeply religious mm. mother, who taught her to think of sex as sinful and wicked. But really, mother was actually a closeted lesbian <laughs> with a voracious mm. appetite mm. for other women, and she was regularly uh, kissed down below by. A uh, neighbour who's played by porn star Kim Wilde, who's here billed as Regina Geisler. Mm. And that's a very, very hot and dream soaked flashback yeah, scene. Yeah. And it's mm. really, really spicy. But then 
So two is the girl girl tangle between Jessica and the Tracy character, mm. and that's a real highlight of the film as far as I'm concerned. It's very sensual, very stirring, and crucially, something that crops up numerous times throughout Moondra's work mm. is its intimacy. Yeah. It it beautifully chore- mm-hmm. it beautifully choreographed, beautifully uh, be- beautifully intimate, and mm. in, in terms of the choreography, I mean by in terms of the stars who are doing it, and in terms of how it's shot, like I love that fan shadow that keeps flickering of course, over yeah, yeah, them, yeah. Mm. and the beads of sweat that just drip from their bodies, mm. and I love love the fact that it just completely facilitates Jessica's sexual awakening. Yeah. And she ends up romping with a male model in the, in, in the shower while her newfound <laughs> lesbian lover takes photos and things like yeah, that. Yeah. And, you know, it just basically, it's the moment where she becomes free and accepts who she is, mm. and it's really, really quite beautiful. But generally, I, th- I thought, you know, we, we've kind of dispensed with James Mathers for the time being, and it's the debut of James Michaels, who's the director of photography, who later went on to uh, shoot um, Sex, the Annabelle Chong story which is a really unique documentary mm. but yeah it's a it's a very sexual film isn't it the role of voyeurism as well yeah is really vital to it what, what i think with 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 the uh, with michael's is photography there's de- mm. it's definitely an interesting look to the picture very much so yeah um there's lots and lots of long takes and mm. lots of shots perched at eye level yeah maybe not voyeurism maybe more like observational I think would be a way to describe it. Okay. It's it's sort of it reminds me a lot of the sort of lingering and languid quality in uh, Steven Soderbergh's Sex Lies and Videotape, mm-hmm. and of course that level of observation links in with the plot. Like Jessica is just watching Tracy all the time. I wouldn't, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether I'd call it voyeurism or more just like a study. Hmm. Because you know, for a long time there isn't any sort of real sexual element to how she considers Tracy no. until she sees her getting it on with her pimp slash agent or whoever the yeah, fella is. Yeah, yeah. It came to video uh, in America in August 1992, but it would be a further seven months before it eventually appeared on um, in UK video shops uh, in March 1993. With the artwork billing it as the new erotic thriller from the director of Night Eyes. Oh, please, there's nothing wrong with a little improvisation. God only knows, this movie needs it. You will act the script the way I wrote it, damn it. Now we'll do it again after you're sober. No one talks to Diana Greer that way. I am the only star you can afford. Do you understand? No one in their right mind would accept this shit-assed role. This movie wouldn't be happening without me! Look, whatever, this movie is not happening. What? What did you say? You're fired! Do you understand me? And you're fired, and you're fired, and you're fired! All of you are fired! I'm leaving. Let's see you make your epic without your star. Now, you're going to disagree with this. However, Ale Godas was the best erotic thriller ever made. (laughs) And I know that because it says it on the box. Okay? (laughs) Good. So now we've got that. I see what you did there. In (laughs) In a quote, no less, that's attributed to the main character of the film, a certain Lisa Moore, played Mm. by uh, someone who would quickly... Enter the Moondra fold as a, as a frequent yeah. player, the great Kathy Shower. Yeah, it reminded me a bit of um, Burn Hollywood Burn. Did, didn't didn't that mm. uh, the Alice, yeah. Jeff Joe Esterhaus film have a quote on the cover saying, "You know, the best film ever made." Quote Alan Smithy. Yeah, and for the record. I think that's a very good comparison to make because <laughs> L.A. Goddess is about as excruciating as Burn Ooh. Hollywood Burn. I love Moondra. I really, really do. I love his work, but this is an absolute slog to get through. I like it more than you because mm. to me, I view it as a big satire on the film industry and the low-budget film industry. Mm. And I think it it almost works in that respect. Well, you know? Again... What you said about Burn Hollywood Burn. 
With very, very few exceptions, I generally hate these sort of (laughs) behind-the-scenes type comedies, satires, because ultimately they are never as funny or as acerbic as they all seem to think they are. I think it's a very, very smug and wanky genre, and in terms of low-budget ones like L.A. Goddess, I think the only ones I rate would be Full Moon's Ginger Dead Man 2 mm-hmm. and Trauma's Terra Firma, yeah, and then cool. sort of form-adjacent ones like uh, Jim Winorski's Body Chemistry 3 yeah. and Richard Gabay's Vice Girls, which flirt with a few deconstructive sure. elements. Yeah, yeah. The rest, though, things like this, <laughs> Fred Olin Ray, whom I love dearly, Bad mm. Girls from Mars... Oh, excruciating. <laughs> Nico Master is his glitch, Jesus. which kind of yeah. fits in with them too. They are, just just to be honest, quite frankly, fucking awful. Yeah, just to fill, <laughs> just to, just to fill everyone in. Um, we, we are looking at a storyline here where, where Kathy Shaw plays a stunt woman on a western. The lead actress is a binging alcoholic played brilliantly by the glorious Wendy McDonald. Mm-hmm. And she eventually takes over the role and falls in love with the producer, yada, yada, yada. McDonald, by the way, is another Moondra yeah, regular. Uh, she's appears terrific. throughout his filmography from Last Call onwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so where does this go wrong for you? Uh, just Generally just the whole satire element? Or, or I mean, it's not much of an erotic thriller, really, is it? I thought the sex was very muted. It's almost mm. a PG-13 friendly in its sort of um, blandness, its beigeness. Mm, mm. Well... Uh, it's multiple reasons, really. Mm. Um, going back, you know, again, if you look at Ginger Dead Man 2 and Terra Firma, yeah. right, they work because they fit within the same budget bracket as the type of productions that they're skewering. Sure. LA Goddess and most of the others, though, they all overreach and they want to tell stories about big studios and big mm. productions mm. and they just don't have the resources to pull them off, which... <laughs> in turn perpetually makes the actual movies themselves appear a lot cheaper than they probably are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, why try and lampoon something that's a world away from what you're actually capable of doing and are yourself familiar with? Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's no verismilitude or any sense that the people making the low-budget ones actually know what they're talking about, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? I'm fairly sure that Moondra is on autopilot. It's absolutely a work for hire job because if you look at the front credits, there is about sixty-two different members of the Crisioni family credited with coming <laughs> up with the story, producing, yeah, yeah. Um, helping out mm. with random bits and bobs behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Uh, even one of them, Debbie Crisioni, who I'm presuming is the wife of one of the Crisioni <laughs> producers, she gets an introducing credit. So right. I think it's some sort of vanity vehicle okay. for whoever this mysterious Mike Crisioni fella is. Yeah, because he wrote the story, didn't he, as well as mm-hmm. Jerry Davis, and an uncredited um, credit for um, Daniel Benton, who we did have previous in, in this in this genre. He penned three, uh, three of John T. Bone's straight movies. I mean, mm. you know, non triple X movies, which were few and far between. In fact. Those three films may have been the only three um, uh, sanitised erotic films that, that John T. Bone made. But yeah, I agree with what you're saying there. It, do, it does kind of make a mockery of the fact when, when uh, Joe Estevez, his kind of line producer character, mm. is, is lambasting the whole, this is this is costing us millions of pounds. And there's like four crew members. Yeah, there's around. four crew members, <laughs> three extras. And yeah. a wagon in the middle of an empty desert. Yeah. Um, I, I, I didn't like the way, though. One of the things that really got to me on this film, um, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is David Havener, uh, who yes. was, was far too bland. It's like Adrian Adrian Smed in, the, in a previous film, even though he's only in it briefly, and Robert Davy in, in, the, in Legal Tender as well. They're, not, they're mm. not made for this genre, and Havener is exactly that. He's far too beige, far too bland, far too nice. And he doesn't mm. really fit the film. And also the way it tends to flirt with this pretty woman style yeah. tendency about halfway yeah, through. Yeah. It suddenly switches in tone where you've got this this wealthy producer trying to sort of revolutionise the life of um, of the, the, this, this poor little stunt woman. Uh, mm. who, who, in fact, is, is brilliantly played by Cathy Shower. Yeah, I mean, credit where it's due, mm. Shower 
is excellent. Yeah. I think Jeff Conaway as the <laughs> Runaway Productions director is, is fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Wendy McDonald, the aforementioned Wendy McDonald, she really goes for it too. Mm-hmm. They're all very committed. Uh, and they attacked what's really a very, very flaccid script with a great deal of gusto. Um, far much more than it deserves, <laughs> I'd say. And uh, Conaway, he actually gets the sole amusing bit when he uh, blasts a golf ball at a bunch of ducks on a golf course <laughs> shortly before quietly stropping off. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't know why I found that as amusing as I did. Because <laughs> I think maybe because laughs are so few and far between in this thing, but... Yeah, I'm not going to question my intuition vis-a, uh, vis-a-vis Kanicki and a bunch of wayward ducks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole pretty woman thing, yeah, the, the kind of wish fulfilment claptrap, the only mm. sort of good thing that comes from that is that you get James Hong popping up as yeah. Heaven's valet, and he <laughs> essentially he's essentially playing the Hector Elizondo part from Pretty Woman, isn't he? That's, mm-hmm. that's his role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was put out by Prism Entertainment, of course, wasn't it? Um, mm-hmm. And again... We had a, a, a trading on the Night Eyes brand, mm-hmm. in that every VHS cassette was emblazoned with the line, you know, from the director of Night Eyes, although it was a company by Last Call. Yeah, over here in the UK. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on the, yeah, and where that was released via Twenty Twenty Vision in what is frustratingly a beautiful looking package, mm. but the film stinker. I swear to God, it has nothing to do with you, Alex. I just, I just can't concentrate right now. Is it someone else? No, no, God. It's something else. I've got all these papers to grade before the trip. I've got a ton of equipment to pack, and I haven't even started on my presentation for the dean tomorrow night. Philip, is that all you ever think about? Work? Never mind. You just answered my question. Where are you going? Shower to masturbate. Look, it's, it's irrelevant which director you happen to idolize in terms of their career. There is mediocrity with all of them mm-hmm. be it Jim Wanowski, be it Dave Dakota, be it Fred Olin Ray, be it Joe Cardone, be it Sam Irvin. All of them have had a misfire from time to time. Yeah, yeah. You know, I go back to the interview I did with a guy called Daniel Matmore sure. from The Mangler and wrote Night Terrors and obviously he so he'd worked with Toby Hooper and he said that you can't be brilliant without making the occasional doo-doo and he likened it to Shakespeare. The Wives of Windsor is a doo-doo. Mm-hmm. Macbeth is magnificent. You yes. can't you can't be brilliant without making the occasional mistake. Mm-hmm. Ellie Goddess mm-hmm. is the Wives of Windsor. Macbeth could well be Wild Cactus. Very, very much so, because this is one of, if not the greatest Jag Mundra film. Now, this was his first collaboration with a screenwriter by the name of Carl Austin. Mm -hmm. This was going to be Austin's first film of ten that he would pen for Mundra. Now, Austin's an interesting character. Um, He's actually the the first cousin of John Singleton, the Mm -hmm. director of Boys in the Hood. You know, he's from South Central. <laughs> he's not your archetypal Hollywood guy, but he just seemed to have a, a brilliant nose for screen. You know, J- Jag, in his interview with Linda Ruth Williams, said that, you know, he turned up in, in the um, interview, didn't say a great deal. Mm. Jag told him exactly what he wanted in the script. And he's kind of just sat there in silence. And, yeah, didn't, didn't write any notes or anything. <laughs> and Moondra just presumed, yeah, it must be the accent. You know, <laughs> that must be the issue here. He mustn't have a clue what I'm going on about. Then, of course, a week later, back he comes, and he's written the script for Wild Cactus, and Moondra says he was completely mm-hmm. blown away. Um, and rightly so, because it, it's a really cool film. I know you'll say I'm biased, and I do can, t- tend to have a slight... You know, passion towards a desert set neo noir. Yes, you do. But you know, you have to admit, it, it's good, isn't it? This it it's absolutely exquisite from top to bottom. Put it this way: the only sort of criticism I have for it is the fact that it misses a pickup shot of a snake right at the film's <laughs> close. The rest of it is just exquisite. You're I absolutely love Wild Cactus, yeah. and I could watch it again and again and again for multiple reasons i think in terms of it uh, in terms of its direction mm. moondra is on fire yeah 
What makes it so good? First off, tight as a drum. Yeah. Not a single minute is wasted. Now, Moondra, as much as I love him, he does have a propensity to sort of dawdle a little bit at times. <laughs> he he mm-hmm. although he's a tremendous visual stylist and although he's brilliant uh with performance mm. and you know knowing where to put the camera and have his cast dance around it and yeah. things like that he's not the best at maintaining a consistent pace whereas mm. this this is paced like a fucking bullet from a gun mm-hmm, it mm. just doesn't let up from the it just grabs you by the collar and refuses to let go um the other thing as well is i know this is something that uh you'd mentioned to me in terms of Mundra is exceptional with female leads a mm. lot of the time, but he often lets his male leads drift into the background, and mm. they're so mm. they're a lot flatter and more two di- uh, sure. a lot flatter and more two dimensional than the women in his films. Whereas this, as well as Mundra being on fire as director, you've got Gary Hudson unleashing an absolute powerhouse performance as the film's antagonist. I'm so glad he's there. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when the film opens and you've got sort of the sight of David Norton, uh, who I like, you know, but he, he automatically I think, oh, God, you know, here we are. We're following the trend already set by Adrian Smed, uh, mm-hmm. David Havener and Robert Davey. Just just the, 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 the very flat male lead in a Jag Mundra film. I mean, there's Havener, uh, there, there's Norton, rather. You know, the character he's playing is very repressed very um unsexual you know his, his wife played by uh, india allen playboy playmate of the year 1988 uh, is kind of begging for sex from him and he doesn't he doesn't show mm. any interest you know even he even snubs a hand job on a deserted desert highway <laughs> is that uptight and uh, so you kind of think just oh god i've got to suffer another one of these um fairly bland male characters but then yeah Gary Hudson uh, shows up who is brilliant I think he's you, you can put wild cactus mm. the t- in terms of its tone and its energy there's a, there's a real it's really bawdy and naughty and a little bit tongue in cheek yeah. at times where it's got a great mean sense of humour to it and that's exemplified by this brilliant brilliant scene in which Hudson in which he has sex with this gun-toting hitchhiker, <laughs> uh, who quickly becomes his partner in crime, yeah. a girl by the name of Maggie, played by Michelle Moffat, mm. uh, who also starred with Hudson in Indecent Behaviour. But the two of them they have sex on top of this stolen, uh, on, on, on top of this car bonnet of the car that they've stolen, mm-hmm. by the side of some train tracks mm. at night, as the train goes by, no less. And it just... You know, it's rugged, it's charismatic, it's dangerous and incredibly sexy, like <laughs> like the entire film itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it, it you've got the, the two leads, you know, India and David Norton, they've gone off to this um, place in the middle of the desert, Arizona, granted the use of this holiday home by the dean of the college that, 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 that Norton works for in order to put a little spark back into their marriage, mm. but they do befriend this couple. And it's a really interesting friendship the, the, you know uh, the, 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 the synopsis kind of hints that they get um, held hostage um, immediately but you know but no, an, hour, no. an hour goes by mm. and they're still a pretty tight it's, couple and there's, there's a little there's a ripple beneath the surface I think that the touchstone for Moondra was straw dogs yeah that's what he mm. said in interviews with it was straw dogs but to me here's a question for you right is this the first post Tarantino influenced erotic thriller. Mm. It could well be, couldn't it? Mm. 1993, yeah, it would make sense. Yeah, but can you call it post Tarantino when, mm. Reservoir Dogs aside, the two key texts that actually bear the most similarity to Wild Cactus, mm. Mm. Natural Born Killers, yeah. and True Romance, yeah. they weren't out. Sure. But it definitely has that <laughs> feel of being cut from the, that cloth. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't know whether it was a David Lynch uh, Wild at Heart thing that they were all invoking, but it definitely mm. it could serve as a, a wonderful middle ground between true romance and natural born killers and stuff. It could do, couldn't it? Yeah, it's, it, 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 there's honestly something so strange, but it, it, it's got that vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you another thing that I love. Yeah. In terms of what you're saying there about the plotting, I'll. Uh, First off, Carl Austin, whenever he writes a Moondra film, it is <laughs> something special. Yes. Every single Austin-scripted Moondra flick is wonderful. 
and stuff. He just knows how to write. He get, he gets the best from Moondra because yeah. he doesn't give him any opportunity to waste time or dawdle. Mm-hmm. But what I love is I love the symmetry of the two parties. True. Yeah. So you've got Gary Hudson's character, Murphy, and mm-hmm. Maggie. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the Marcuses, played by uh, David Norton and India Allen. Mm-hmm. And what you've got is, so you've got the bad guys and the good guys converging on Arizona at the same time, and True. they're both looking for different things. Revenge for the <laughs> first two, mm-hmm. and a career opportunity and sexual satisfaction for the latter two. Yeah, yeah. And then that just leads to a whole spread of just these wonderful, up there with last call in terms of jaw-dropping moments mm-hmm, and sights. Mm-hmm. You know, so you've got this unbearably, unbearably tense scene where Murphy and Maggie accost Celeste, mm-hmm. who's played by Kathy Shower, mm-hmm. the girl that Murphy's looking for in her trailer. You've got uh, Indy Allen's character, Alex, trying to escape Murphy and Maggie's clutches in her underwear when they hold a hostage at home. Mm-hmm. David Norton, snake handler. David Norton, tear arsing across the <laughs> desert on a moped in a vest to try and save his wife. Yeah, it's just yeah. wonderful, wonderful stuff. That third, though, that final third, where you've got that, that threesome of um, of Indy Allen, um, Gary Hudson and Michelle Moffat, mm. uh, I thought that was phenomenal. Um, you know, it, it's just, it, 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 it's wild. I thought Indy Allen in that last half hour of the film mm. is unbelievable. I think it's one yeah. of the best performances in a in a Mundra film, really. I did have to laugh at Kathy Shower momentarily. Um, she kind of looks a little bit like Glenn Close mm, yeah, in this yeah, film. I see that. The fact that she's stroking a bunny yeah. did pop into my head. <laughs> but that's an aspect that does go through most Mundra films. There's yeah. a lot of uh, there's a lot of in jokes to mm. other movies in there and stuff. I think that that was him again in Last Call. You've got a scene where he pays homage to Fatal Attraction, yeah. where Shannon Tweed and William Cat get it on in an elevator, mm-hmm. very much like Glenn Close and Michael Douglas did. Mm-hmm. That, of course, Adrian Lyne re- sort of returned the favour so. in, uh, what was it, Indecent Proposal, Correct. where there's a scene that echoes Last Call where they're having sex with all the money on the bed. Yeah. Um, so I think that this is another sort of little wink in the direction of Fatal Attraction. This is mm-hmm. Moondra tipping his hat to the fact that without Fatal Attraction, he probably wouldn't be making these type of movies. Mm-hmm. I do want to draw attention, though, before we move on to the next one, that an- another real... R- another thing that I really, really love about Wild Cactus is this weird fatalistic aspect right. to it. How, like... Murphy and Maggie happen across each other and how in turn they're happened across by the Marcuses. Mm. Mundra plays it as a sort of inevitability of these forces kind of cosmically aligning and being drawn yeah. together. Um, and I think you can you can make a convincing case for how Murphy and Maggie are meant to be the physical manifestation of the Marcuses' marriage problems. Mm. Mm. Uh, so they they sort of presented and come across as this literal test that the Marcuses have to overcome in order to be strong again as a couple. Look, there's some things that just shouldn't be standard procedure. The coroner, the police, of course, they apologise for having to put you through it. But apologies never pay for something like that. Please. Take your time. We could take a break if you like. Um, I'm sorry. I promised myself I wouldn't do this. I can imagine what you've been through, Mrs... Should we call you Mrs. Singh, or does being married to a Maharaja give you a title we should use? My husband used to say Americans are infatuated by titles, but given a choice, they'd rather have the money. That's why I hope you can understand how I feel slightly embarrassed about this. It seems my husband left a rather generous estate. Jack Mundra was always keen to try and make a thriller in India. And when the opportunity arose, he brought in the services of his old friend Michael Potts, who of course wrote Night Eyes 2 and such like. Um, it didn't go so well though, did it? No, no. <laughs> um, we should note as well, Ashok Amritraj was very, very keen as well to make an Indian-American crossover film. Mm-hmm. So it was something that both he as producer and Mundra as director were passionate about and they would talk about doing something like it a lot, but they could never sort of find the right story. What's interesting, though, is that with their final film together, Tropical Heat, which was an Indian-American crossover film, is Mm -hmm. that 
ultimately it turned out to be so disastrous that it completely <laughs> killed their creative partnership. Yeah. And it would lead to Moondra years, years later, over a decade later, Moondra would allude to tropical heat being the failure, but it quite rightly is. Mm-hmm. Um, and he'd go on to describe Indian Hollywood crossover films as being a myth mm-hmm. that ultimately failed to meet the expectation of either audience as what their demands and expectations are as viewers are so wildly different. Yeah, uh, He said that in an interview with Showbiz India TV and he went on to say that he used to be a big proponent of trying to do Indian slash Hollywood crossover films, but in his opinion they just don't work, or rather they very rarely work, because he does note that it has happened every now and again, but as far as he was concerned, those sort of films are neither fish nor fowl. They're either a hit in one country or the other, never both. They're frequently no more than art house or niche appeal hits in the US, or they're complete flops outright in both India and Hollywood, and that was definitely, definitely the case for Tropical Heat. Without doubt. Potts came up with a script about Nigerian death kits, which is kind of an insurance scam, uh, which ultimately entailed an investigator coming out to see what was what. Amritraj liked Potts' idea and commissioned him to write a script. He then sent copies of the script to his distributors, both Prism and Promark. This was done on a Friday afternoon, but he was told by Steve Bezik, the guy who owned Promark, that he already planned to turn down the project, but he was going to read the script as a courtesy. However, by the time the next week came around, he got a call from Steve, and he said that they loved the script and they were committed to put the money up to make the film. Jag was hired to direct the film, and because of his connections in the Bollywood film industry, he was used to negotiate the best financial deals in hiring an Indian cast and crew. Um, although when he was hired to do the film, Mundra made it pretty clear that he wasn't happy with the ending of the film. And in fact, he said to Linda Ruth Williams that he absolutely despised the script. Mm-hmm. Yeah. However, Potts goes on to say that Mundra agreed with him that they, they would do various changes to the script and a few different drafts, etc., etc. Yeah, to, to get it up to snuff. Yeah, but it never happened because other things came in the way, things like production problems and chain and, and, and issues to do with shooting in India. So any script changes never happened between Potts and Mundra. Anyway, the film was shot, wrapped, and Ashok Amritraj invited Potts to go to a preview screening uh, with Steve Be- Bezik and uh, Barbara Javits of Prism. Pot said that, yeah, the opening sequence was quite decent, but after that the film went downhill. You know, the, one of the early scenes was meant to take place in an L.A. Uh, office, high-rise office, <laughs> but in fact um, it was just done in a um, madras uh, room with a hastily dressed set that was done by placing a desk in front of a shabby looking brown curtain and they recruited the sound man to play the part of the insurance company president. He said, at that point, I knew the film was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, the film only occasionally bore any resemblance to what I had written and Jag, for whatever reason, had taken it upon himself to completely rewrite the script and in doing so, resorted to every trite Bollywood cliche that he could think of. When the film ended, Barbara Javits was livid, and I was afraid to ask Steve Bezik what he thought. A week or so later, Ashok Armitraj told me that the word had gone out on what a crappy job Jag had done on the film, and the people in the industry had been warned not to hire him. Yeah, um, I mean, that's tropical heat in a nutshell, it isn't is. it, really? Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> like, the location... Is marvelous. It, it, it is. It, That's a travel log. Yeah, oh. it, it, it was shot in Madras, which yeah. is the same place where Amritraj would have Fred Olin Ray shoot yeah. Inferno mm-hmm. a few years later, which, by the way, is a phenomenal movie. Mm-hmm. And yes, I, as you say, the travel log. I love the Indian flavor, and I, 
I love that it gives a lot a lot of the film such a great vibe and feel. It's production value and authenticity that money can't buy. Mm. And and one of the few things that Tropical Heat gets right is that, like Wild Cactus, there's just such a great sense of place to it. Mm. And for that alone, I think it's worth at least one watch. Just seeing Mundra capture a pocket of his homeland on yeah, film yeah. amidst an erotic thriller backdrop. Mm. The film's severely hindered by a lot of things. Uh, one is that the lead, Rosevich, both he and Diabo, the ex-Bond girl, mm. they're very, very bland, both in terms of their characters and as performers. Mm-hmm. Uh, another is that Mundra's cinematographer, V. Shau- uh, v. Shaukat, mm. uh, and his Indian crew, they are quite clearly unaccustomed to making American-style movies. So, as beautiful and as exotic as India is presented, it's purely happenstance and due to the inherent production value afforded by the location if you get me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, because visually tropical heat it's just got such a flat and stylish mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. often very cheap and very hurried look the film really really lacks Mundra's sense of pomp and ceremony yeah. and the finesse mm-hmm. that typifies his work yeah. you've got all these shots that are quite awkwardly framed and they have no depth and no mm. artfulness to them whatsoever um, well, most of them, because there is the drowning bit where you've got the light dancing across the reflection mm-hmm, of the pool. Mm-hmm. That, that's gorgeous, I'll give it that. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, a handful more visuals that are pretty striking. But, yeah, they are... It's not a common occurrence, and the whole thing just falls victim to Mundra's poor sense of pace. Mm-hmm. Again, he's always had a kind of offbeat rhythm, but here it's just slow, even at like 86 minutes in length. Like Tropical Heat, it feels at least three times that, <laughs> and it really feels like you're putting in a shift watching it. Yeah, there's some terrible sex as well. Yeah. I mean, there's one sequence where um, Rosovich and Diabo are, uh, I think they're snogging in a temple, and then it cuts to this like waterfall river sequence. Mm where you have Rosovich's big white butt is it, it, straight from the cut. Yeah. And he's wearing a pair of water shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on now. You know, think of the whim of, of actually going to have sex in a river stroke waterfall scenario. You're saying, hang on, I need to put my water shoes on first. Yeah. It just it kills the um, eroticism of it yes, completely. It, it does. I mean... <sighs> And he, he also fits in with that long line of bland Mundra leads. Yes, and I think he's among the worst. Oh, Rick, Rick Rossovich, best, better known as Sarah Connor's roommate's boyfriend in The Terminator <laughs> or Slider in Top Gun. Mm. Uh, very, very dull. Yeah, but, I, did, I, did, I did a film uh, that Michael Schroeder directed uh, a couple of years after this called Cover Me, mm. which has a, a remarkable... Um, um, thematic uh, connection with, with, with a later Jag Mundra film. But yeah, Rosovich was just the worst thing in that yeah. completely. Um, I will say this though, if you if you consider Indian filmmaking standards and practices at the time, the fact that Mundra and Amritraj m- managed to return to their conservative home country mm. and make an erotic thriller, I'll give them credit for making what's really quite a wonderful and subversive fuck you to the Indian filmmaking system. And, you know... An elephant saves the day at the end, which is kind of hilarious. How the hell did you get in here? Magic. Ooh, feisty. Kind of like that. I suggest you leave before I call hotel security. And tell them what? I stuck my room key in a man's bikini underwear and he had the nerve to use it? I didn't do it. Someone else did. You thirsty? I'm thirsty. Let's have a drink. Who do you think you are? Who do you think I am? No offense, but I think you're conceited and rather presumptuous. No offense, Aiden Christine. How do you know my name? I told you. Magic. Mundra and Amateur obviously had a falling out in the wake yeah. of Tropical yeah. Heat, didn't they? So he, he's really got very little options to go back to. So inevitably, he goes back to Axis, mm-hmm. uh, and he makes a film that he regards to be the best that he's made, or his favourite at least. Yeah, of his erotics, yeah, without question. Sexual Malice, aka The Other Man, has it ever been recorded as The Other Man anywhere? That maybe a TV, a Skinamax name? That was its original title, right? Actually, right, right. yeah, and uh, 
but then and that was to bring it in line with the other woman mm, this earlier course. Axis film which was a, a nice little hit for the company and Moondra mm-hmm. um, however Axis went with Sexual Malice which is a much more on the nose and but a very very fitting title because mm. it is the thrust of the film yeah sexual games and sexual cruelty absolutely and we also get introduced to well, one of my favourite actors from the whole erotic thriller genre which is Doug Jeffrey mm-hmm. do you like him? yes I like him a lot yeah I think he's great um, I, again I hate to harp on at the same subject but he's, he's a proper erotic lead mm-hmm. you know he's, he's got everything he's, you know, think of him to me he kind of appears as the love child of Jeffrey Donovan and Edward Burns mm. albeit with a jawline that could slice a watermelon <laughs> and, and a chin that even Bruce Campbell would be envious of uh, born in New Jersey, he spent the early part of his life honing the craft of being an entrepreneur. Uh, he calls himself a self-made businessman who at an early age ran a hot dog cart business before in his 20s touring the world as an official host for the Chippendales. Uh, he moved to LA to pursue his acting dream and became, as his website loosely puts it, a leading man in over a dozen feature films. <laughs> dozen feature films. Nothing specific. He then moved into furniture making, uh, which led to him forming 41 Sets, his very own set design and construction company. He also runs a boutique wine label these days. Interesting you were saying about the furniture making, because my criticism I have of sexual malice Mm. is that Doug Jeffrey is very wooden. (laughs) He is a little. I think this was his very first role. Um, I think he went on to do four or five Jack Mundra films. Mm. I know we've covered a few... um, a few of his Mystique films appearances for the Schlock Pit, uh, films like uh, Smooth Operator and also Killing for Love, which are both tremendous, and you, you, you must seek them out um, uh, super quick because they're, they're fantastic. But yeah, he is a little bit uh, wooden. Yeah. But his, his, the saving grace is that though, I mean, he's not awful by any stretch of the imagination, but it's mm. quite clear when you get onto something like Moondra's Irresistible Impulse, it's very, very obvious that Jeffrey's taken a few acting classes yeah, before yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, without doubt. But his character, this, this mysterious fellow by the name of Quinn, <laughs> he is wonderful. Yeah, brilliant. And, you, you know, again, the film, it's built from a script uh, by Carl Austin. Mm-hmm. Second who, film. Mm-hmm. Yep, who works from a story conceived by Moondra and the act the, the story is just utterly utterly fantastic it's just a great great erotic drama mm, yeah yeah, the, yeah the, the story is typical Moondra with with Christine played by um, Diana Barden who's very unsatisfied by her sexless marriage to um, to Richard played by um, sort of matinee idol looking Edward Albert. The late, great Edward Oh, Albert. he was great. Yes, he's great in was. this. Yeah. He's very chilled. He always, it seems like he's high in almost every scene. <laughs> um, but he's great. So she goes uh, and has uh, an affair with this, this this mysterious Quinn. A male stripper. Yeah. Who she's encouraged to sort of hook up with <laughs> by her friend Nicole, who's played by the beautiful Samantha Phillips, mm, a, mm. a woman who has been burnt in my mind since she whopped her bangers out in Phantasm 2. <laughs> um... But yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff. It's it's the disintegration of a marriage, mm, but then it mm. quickly turns into this whole elaborate series of sexual games between uh, Christine and the mysterious Quinn, yeah. uh, and then it becomes apparent that, like, what, what were you say? You know, Ed, Edward Albert is fantastic. Yeah absolutely fantastic and when you first meet him you think that their marriage is crumbling mm. and stuff and that's the impression that's coming across and he looks like he has got the weight of the world on oh, his he shoulders he is absolutely crushed he knows that his wife mm. is drifting away from mm-hmm, him mm-hmm. he knows that like you know everything he loves is just burning to the ground basically yeah. but as the movie transpires it's not for reasons that are initially painted mm-hmm. you know he's First off, he's presented as a guy who potentially has erectile dysfunction, <laughs> but it turns out it's much more sinister than that. Yeah. And he just does that entire arc well, how he goes from this guy who you just feel desperately, tragically sorry for, yeah. to, oh my God, what a fucking bastard. Yeah. And you, you don't... Do you expect that? I didn't expect that. No, not at I mean, you, you tend to... There it, tends to be the, the, the suspicion with erotic thrillers mm. that they're very paint by numbers 
with with very telegraphed um, plot twists and all that kind of thing. But that's not necessarily the case. Mm. Mm. Because for the, the, the book of this film, you have no idea. I but, feel like uh, we're spoiling it, even just broaching it in the loosest bit. terms that we are. But, but obviously, no one can watch it anyway. So yeah, it's like it's, it, I mean, where you, you can't find this damn thing yeah. anymore, which is an absolute crime because it, it, it it's fabulous. But yeah, there's just there's so much going on. Like Quinn Jeffrey's part, he mm. he's got this real strange streak to him. Yeah, where initially he comes across as quite like a, a, a gentleman suitor, maybe a bit. Mm. blokey and uh, a bit uh, horn dog and stuff but when it turns out that he's actually quite sadistic mm. and he's all about playing these twisted sexual games with Christine and she's obviously falling in love with him and he becomes a bit of a threat to her and Richard's marriage mm-hmm. but then the whole film sort of goes back over on itself and not again nothing is as it seems and it's mm. such Moondra juggles the plot like nobody's business. Like, he takes you up one alley, swerves, takes you back down another. It is a real, real dramatic roller coaster, and it is so expertly presented and delivered. Moondra is at the top of his game. Without doubt, and sexually as well. Mm. I mean, for me, I think, you know, the, the, the scene uh, just underneath the pier. Oh, beautiful. Very cold. But, yeah. But I think it's one of his... <laughs> I think one of his best shot sex scenes. Yeah, the, uh, what's really clever about it is at first, the first romp between Quinn mm. and Christine, it's really, really tepid. And it's like, oh, is this it? Is this all going to be the sex? But yeah. then the second romp, the one, as you say, under the pier as the tide comes in, just marvellous, marvellous stuff. Just very spirited, very energetic, and very, very well done in terms of blocking and how it's stylized. Mm. Probably one of my favourite Moondra sex scenes, Definitely. actually. De- up there with the epic uh, kiss to shag, transition in last call <laughs> um, the second lesbian tangle in the other woman mm-hmm. and uh, the real side rogering in Wild Cactus but with all that in mind what's great about sexual malice is that it soon becomes obvious that each sex scene is getting increasingly more over the top and out of hand mm. and it's all part of Quinn's strange hedonistic plan mm-hmm. very much so um, there's a big gap between these two coming to, sorry, this coming to video in, in both the United Kingdom and the USA. It mm-hmm. came to video stores in America on March the 16th, 1994, but it would be 18 months before the UK would get it through 2020 video on November the 29th, 1995, with the uh, immense tagline, Sex so hot, it's deadly. <laughs> Um, of all the Moondra films, though, mm. I do believe that Sexual Malice is the one that would most benefit from a Blu-ray release yeah, or a 4K right. release mm-hmm. or something like yeah. that. Again, it's James Mathers uh, mm. di- directing the photography, and it's such a beautiful, slick and noir-soaked film, just yeah. steeped in inky black shadows and just spiked with blue highlights and the occasional splash of red. Lots of gliding, elegant camera work, and it's it, glorious to look at. Very, very stylized. Well, you certainly have an eye for the young ladies, don't you? It's, uh, it's not exactly like that, sir. I... Don't worry about it. I was young once myself. I got around quite a bit, too. My wife, God bless her soul, she used to turn a blind eye to it all. Not like the women of today. They all want to be treated like equals. Yeah, if you ask me, they want to be treated like men. After working with producers like Ashok Amritraj, and Gregory Dark, Moondra decided to give it a go himself, and so formed a company called Everest Pictures, which went quite well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, him and Victor Bala, his long-time producer, they've got a lot of credits together, most of which we've already talked about here. But I believe their collaboration dates back as far as uh, Open House, maybe? Yeah, it could yeah? be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Everest, basically... It was set up because Moondra, he was sick of making money for other people. He <laughs> exactly. just wanted a piece of that pie. Yeah. However, you know, what better way to lose money than by trying to get a film into theatres? <laughs> and that's what they did with Improper Conduct, their first uh, collaboration in the erotic thriller genre. Released, given the, a limited uh, theatric release in, in the United States on June the 9th, 1994, Todd McCarthy and Variety said that called it a sexploitationer dressed up in politically correct garb, while Entertainment Weekly 
dubbed it as one of Mundra's duller efforts. Although the LA Times were kind enough to say it was a deftly spun psychological thriller. You're fun? I love it. Mm. I think in proper conduct, brilliant. Yeah. There's a great topicality mm-hmm. to it. It's built from a story by Moondra, screenplay again by the brilliant Carl Austin, yeah. and the whole film, it's about sexual harassment, yeah. which, if you put it within the context of Moondra's career, it's sort of a return to the issues-based films that Moondra made at the start of his career mm-hmm. uh, and would make when he relocated back to India at the turn of the millennium. So I think that this is sort of an interesting midpoint between his erotics and his issue-oriented films. Mundra himself, he's never admitted it. Yeah, I don't think he'd be that, like, shameless to do no. so. But Improper Conduct was almost certainly assembled to cash in on the ballyhoo surrounding uh, Michael Crichton's then-upcoming novel Disclosure Definitely. and its mm. subsequent film adaptation, which was very much a talking point in the not just the industry press, but in the general press at the time of Improper Conduct's making. Mm-hmm. I think a weakness about this film, uh, although I love it a great deal, is that it can sometimes veer into CBS Sunday night territory. You know, you can almost insert the ad breaks yourself at times. So that that, that is a slight weakness. Is it does sometimes come across mm. as a TV movie. Well, to me. But I'm not saying that as a negative. No, no, and, and you know, knowing you, I know that you love your you you love a good TV drama. Mm. But um, improper conduct, three movies in one. It is, isn't it? That's so mm, trippy. That's what it is. Because <laughs> we start off with, with, with Ashley, who's Tani Walsh, the daughter of Rucka Walsh. Um, and she, she's like in a marketing company and harassed by the boss, yeah. who is a bit of a, a grim. The um, brilliant John Laughlin, reuniting <laughs> with Moondra after sexual malice. Such a lech. Yeah, and he's uh, fantastic. So, yeah, so he, he sexually harasses her. Yeah. And, and um, she's left sort of practically rocking back and forth on her sofa, uh, stroking her pussy cat. Um, <laughs> Man, you went there. While she, um, well, well, well they, they form a case, because, mm-hmm. and the case does not go well, does it? No. Which you'll, so you go from an issues-based office drama yeah. to a courtroom thriller, yeah. and finally, and probably the weakest section of the film, is a revenge thriller. Um, now, I will say, as a whole, Moondra does succeed in weaving them together, at least for me. Um, they all work on their own, but crucially, they fit together too. Uh, I do think it's a really impressive and ambitious bit of storytelling mm. on Moondra's part, uh, because he's done it before, trying to weave genres. But this, this is his finest attempt at that and his most well-rounded narrative achievement. Um you know, the words I've got in my notes, intelligent, gripping, cohesive, but, 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 I will say that of the three strands, again, it's that revenge plot that's the weakest, purely because the transformation of one key character who was quite prudish and condemning mm-hmm. at the start, mm-hmm. she suddenly becomes this, uh, <laughs> you know, sexy angel of vengeance. Yeah. And it just suddenly happens. There's no sort of well-realised bit of character development. No, no. There, but, you know, it, as a revenge thriller, that aspect of it, it's good fun, and it does provide a, I guess, a sort of exciting uh, ending to the overarching story. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's, that's a fair enough point. I, I mean, the, the sex in it is, is pretty impressive. I think One of my favourite scenes, and I know you said it was contained within the weakest part of the film, but I think the motel sex, you know, the champagne-soaked motel mm. sex scene is, is one for the Mundra show. Yeah, with the uh, with the cork popping and the oh, yeah. and the fizz going everywhere. I Delicious. wonder what that implies. <laughs> well, that's tremendous. <laughs> and there's um, there's a fair bit of groping on the office printer as well, which mm. I'm, I'm not sure if that's been copied. Oh, dad jokes. Yeah. Oh. What I love about it is that although the cast are pretty good by and large, again you've got. Tony Welch, who, mm-hmm. as you say, the daughter of uh, iconic mega babe Raquel Welch. Yeah. Um, you've got Kathy Shower mm-hmm. appearing in it amidst the ensemble. Uh, you've got Leanne Beeman, uh, Wendy McDonald, and Matt Rowe, all those wonderful Moondra regulars among the ensemble. Even uh, your mate Adrian's Med pops up. Yeah. 
But the absolute keynote player in it is John Laughlin. Yes, he's tremendous. Utterly, utterly fantastic. Mm. I love Laughlin's performance. His slightly stooped gait. It gives him this mm. real sort of snaky and predatory vibe. He's always slivering around the place as this you know, hotshot boss who isn't afraid to harass his female co-workers. Uh, and he's just hanging all over the Ashley character, and he's just far too touchy-feely. Really creepy, really, really uncomfortable. And and what struck me is that we've all met people, well, we've all met men, and it almost is exclusively men, we've all met men like that. Mm. Because these overly tactile office sleazes who speak in these thinly veiled and ever so slightly threatening innuendos. But what's cool there is that his... His character's complemented by the fact that the rest of the office men are just as bad. They're all these, like, walking hard-ons just constantly trying to fuck their way (laughs) around the place. And I think that Carl Austin, his script, it really, really captures something. Um, You know, I'm sure a few people would probably think it a bit over the top and overblown, but I've worked in environments very similar Mm. to this, and I encountered blokes who speak the same way, where everything is a front for them trying to get their end away, and they're basically just a pack of fucking wolves. It's astonishing. It's just like when, um, when, 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 when Lachlan first joins the company, and then he's shown around by his father-in-law Frost, played by Stuart Whitman. Mm. You know, he's got that line about, you know, my wife used to turn a blind eye to it, but you know, these women these days. These women these days with their equality. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, of course, um, I, th- I think I think it's um, Tony Welsh's character. She walks into the room where Doug uh, is saying, uh, is, is gossiping with his mates. And he's like, uh, yeah, you were right about her. A few drinks and she went down like the Titanic. Mm. And it's just so grim. Some of the dialogue. You know, as you say, at first you think, ah, this is so overblown. But no, so it's, exaggerated, it's so, it's but so no. true. It's mm-hmm. so true. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Austin and Moondra, they've also got quite a radical feminist streak to yeah. the film, the way they've characterised so. yeah. uh, Ashley. I, I mm. love the fact that she's very open sexually and how she, she says something like that she sleeps with no more people than the average guy does. Yeah. Um, and quite rightly, she doesn't see a problem with that. It's everyone else who's wanting to fucking slut shame her yeah, and absolutely. stuff like that. Uh, and the, the, again, the women are just as bad as well. They're all quick to paint her as the office slut and stuff, and act mm-hmm. like when when Lachlan's character starts harassing her, that she, you know, that old chestnut. Well, you were asking for it, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, and it's just oh, absolutely awful. It made its VHS premiere um, only three months after uh, its brief theatrical run on September the twenty eighth, nineteen ninety four, and it would be a year before improper conduct landed in the UK courtesy of New Age Entertainment in August 95. New Age Entertainment, of course, being the company that put out such great 90s director video fodder like Metal Beast and also Fred Olin Ray's Natural Cold Killer, <laughs> which we know for more, more, more universally as Inner Sanctum 2. Improper Conduct then premiered on UK TV on Channel 5 on July the 27th, 1998. Why are you doing this, Mr. Lovejoy? Excuse me? Why are you wasting my time? Maybe there's something I didn't explain. I already know everything you're telling me. I've done thorough research on this property as I do on all my purchases. I'm ready to go forward with this deal. Excellent. Do you have the papers with you, Mr. Lovejoy? Right here. I want you to call me Carolyn. Okay. Carolyn? (laughs) Fine. You fill them out. I have an ever so slight hangover, and I'm going to take a shower. When you're done, wait for me here, and I'll cut you a check for the deposit. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lovejoy. I know you, and even though I wasn't here, I could see your face when you pressed the remain button on your remote control on your DVD player, and you saw the irresistible impulse 
<laughs> was nine minutes shy of two hours. Yes, 111 minutes. And let me tell you now, there is absolutely no need whatsoever <laughs> for anything, anything at all, to be that long. It is a truly arse numbing runtime, especially for a director video film. You know, when I saw when I saw it with this, my heart I, I, <laughs> my head nearly exploded like something yeah. on scanners. It is that is Nico Masterakis levels of horror <laughs> that running time fills me with. Mm-hmm. However, much to my complete and utter delight, irresistible impulse works. It is exactly as long as it needs to be, and of all the films, if you were to tell me that of Mundra, who, as I've said, isn't a man renowned for his perfect pacing, mm. that his longest, one of his longest movies, one of his longest erotic thrillers, at least, mm-hmm. would be one of his most perfectly paced. Yeah. I would honestly, I would have fallen off my chair. Mm-hmm. But it is, it is exquisitely done, and it rockets by. It does, doesn't it? It's without question his most noirish film, mm-hmm. classic noir tropes, and. Again, similar to Last Call, uh, we have a real estate guy, uh, played by Doug Jeffrey. And, (laughs) you know, he has it all. He could have it all, but he seems determined to screw it all up. Mm -hmm. You know, he has wealth, he has success. He has an ex-wife, but still, he's he's friendly with the ladies, especially clients who can, you Mm -hmm. know, give him big houses to sell. However, he has a gambling problem. Uh, and he owes a lot of money, which brings into the notion the idea of Carolyn. Carolyn Weatherby, played by the excellent and regular Mundra player Wendy MacDonald, uh, who's a rich widow uh, who he has sex with and then she dies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> um, however, Carolyn was in the midst of writing a check, uh, didn't sign it, she dies, he signs it anyway, takes the cash. But then uh, Leanne Beeman, shows up playing Janine Miller and swears to him that she's Caroline's PA and maybe they can earn a few quid. Mm. My over my overriding feeling for Irresistible Impulse is I love how it, the cruel sense of humour <laughs> to it. In short, Mundra absolutely relishes stacking the deck. <laughs> Against Doug Jeffrey's Jesus. character oh. at every single opportunity. You know, you've got him. There's just threat from every angle. He's threatened mm. by his ex wife, who's played by regular Kathy Shower. Yep, yep, yep. Um, because he's been trying to pay off his gambling debts with money from, uh, from her account and forging her signatures. Mm. So she gives him 24 hours to pay her the money he owes her back. Mm-hmm. In tandem with that, the money that he owes to the dapper mafioso, played by the brilliant Fred Olin Ray and Jim Wynorski, yes. and say Jay Richardson, who can do these kind of roles <laughs> in his sleep, by the way. Mm. This is just him doing his sort of fugitive rage shtick. Which he shot the same year. Yeah. He has also given uh, Richard 24 hours to pay back the, the cool 25k that he owes him as well. Yeah. On top of that, just when he thinks he can pay <laughs> both of these people back with the cool commission yep. from this massive land sale, mm-hmm. it turns out the woman who he's just parked, as you say, snuffs it. <laughs> and then to make things worse, oh. he's, that, he's got a blackmailer onto him. Yep. And the whole thing is just one elaborate, ever, ever escalating series of awful things happening to this guy. And it is, there are times where it is screamingly funny yep. in a really, really sort of macabre and oh. ghoulish way. Mm-hmm. It's it's a moral maze because Richard, Doug Jeffrey's character, is no good. <laughs> he is a no good swindler, and you shouldn't feel the remotest sense of empathy for him. But because of this, because of everything being stacked up, you can't help but feel a pang <laughs> of of sorriness and, and for, mm. for just just mm. sympathy for his his situation. And it feels so wrong to feel that way, but you can't help it. No, yeah, he's, he's a very He's relatably flawed, yeah. and he's so mm. so annoyingly likable. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. even even Kathy Shower's character, you know, you still mm. see that she has a torch for him, even though they're going through yeah. this divorce. Well, because he's so charming, and funny <laughs> with it. Um, but again, this is gorgeously, gorgeously shot yeah. film. Mm. Uh, it's shot by David Dakota, regular Howard Wexler, yeah. and it just looks absolutely exquisite. I mean, what a year he was having. When you think of that, that that, that same year, he shot 
over the wire. He shot Prayer the Jaguar. Mm-hmm. And in October 96, he goes to shoot Leather Jacket Love Story. I mean, mm. Howard Wexler is one of the undersung oh, one of the heroes. Yeah, one yeah. of the greats. Um, what I love about it is that... Well, so the film's scripted by Peter Faldy, who's working... From a original script concocted by George Ferris and his writing partner, the aforementioned Matt Rowe. You did get his name wrong. It All is right. the it is the Canadian number one top selling pop star, Peter Foley. I did not know that. He had a number one hit in Canada. Wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And that he did do a page one rewrite of a George Ferris and Matt Rowe script, which is interesting. Mm. Um because, you know, when you think of the film that we haven't spoken about yet. That's a that's a decent script from George and Matt. So you wonder what the flaws were in mm, the script where mm. Jag would make Peter Foldy do a rewrite. But nevertheless, there's a lot of great performances mm. in this movie. As as we've said, Jeffrey is he's clearly taken. <laughs> you know he he he's done his homework yes. and he's got himself up to grade here. Mm-hmm. Leanne Beeman as the uh, shady Janine. She is. Absolutely, absolutely mm-hmm. exquisite. And there's a great scene which involves her, Jeffrey, and uh, co-scriptor Matt Rowe, who's cast oh, as yeah, he, yeah. he's cast as Doug Jeffrey's boss, who <laughs> he's the one who offers him a lifeline with this massive commission. Mm-hmm. And again, he's play he's just excellent. I honestly just love any time he appears in something, and yeah. I miss him so so much mm. as a performer and as a writer. Um, because obviously, if you didn't know, Roe, he very, very sadly passed away at the age of 51 on the 9th of October 2003 from uh, multiple melanoma. Here, every ounce of oily charisma that courses through his body, Roe just dominates every scene that he's in, along with Jay Richardson, who isn't in it enough for my liking. No, 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 no. However, there's this wonderful, wonderful scene where, where when it's revealed that McDonald's character is still alive, but she's not still alive because it's someone else <laughs> pretending to be it. And the look of utter confusion on Jeffrey's face as Leanne Beeman comes walking in mm. and she just stares him down through these black glasses. She's like an alien. She's mm. like a monster oh, yeah. in that scene. And it, you don't know whether she's the living dead or whether, you know, it, it's really creepy and sexy at the same time. And then to cap it off, you've got Matt Rowe just bumbling around mm-hmm. doing his sort of like smug oily shtick in the background <laughs> and it's just such a wonderful complicated and silly and scary and sexy scene all at once and it's probably some of the best acting within Moondra's oeuvre yeah. at that point without doubt Moondra had a real fetish for aquatic based shenanigans mm. and you know there's no let up here because we have a sort of strange riff on from here to eternity, where they're, they're both getting it on in the sea. Mm-hmm. and um, I took that as a double indemnity, kind of. Oh, did you? Was, yeah, as a purposeful double indemnity kind of wink. Right, okay. There's also what we were saying earlier about Moon, Moondra sort of tipping the hat to other films and stuff. They even recycled yeah. the fish called Wonder Goldfish <laughs> eating gag, only they play it completely straight. Did, I think that's, yeah. that's very cool. But there is scene after scene within mm. Irresistible Impulse that is just absolutely wonderful. Um the, the bit with McDonald, who is absolute apex mm, milf, mm, mm. where she's leading Doug Jeffrey on this merry dance before <laughs> she signs the paperwork, and she just delights in toying with him. Yeah. And Moondra, he really ratchets up the sexual tension between them, yeah. which, uh, you know, as any red blooded heterosexual guy would, Jeffrey quickly surrenders to. Mm. Um, and then I also, I, I, I just love this gorgeously ghoulish moment where Richard has to get rid of her body later on in the narrative, where it's cross-cut with this sex scene between his co-worker, Heather, and another fella who turns out to be pretty uh, integral to the machinations of the plot. Within that moment, there's these brilliant synchronised match cuts, so you've got the last getting scooped up by the fella that she's shagging, And then you quickly cut to Richard in time, slinging Weatherby's body (laughs) over his shoulder. And the juxtaposition of of, of pleasure with the macabre, of of the flesh alive and being passionately (laughs) devoured, with with the flesh rotting and decomposing, I just love that. That's just a real great bit of direction on Moondra's part. And um, again, further proof of the film's cruel and morbid humour. It's like... um, do you remember what I said about body chemistry too, where where the big sex scene is in a cut with a moment of horrific violence, mm. thus ruining the happy wanking of the raincoat brigade. <laughs> it's that same sort of thing, yeah, you know, yeah. giving you like a really grotesque moment in tandem with the titillation to really throw you off course and mess you up a bit. Just mm. great stuff. 
Mundra's openly admitted that this was his last good sale for an erotic thriller. Mm. And do you think there are elements of this film that hint at him trying to edge away from maybe the uh, Axis style of erotic filmmaking more towards a thriller, further to where he was when he started out? Hmm, interesting. Very, very interesting because there is, you know, there is a, a fair smattering of sex yeah. in this, but it's a lot more. I think this one. But then, having said that, it, it's a Carl Austin script, right? Mm. So, with Austin, there's always a certain. There's more emphasis on plot and character than there is in most other Moondra films when he's working from an Austin script, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. So maybe it's a mixture. Maybe it's a case of Carl Austin's writing is just so bloody good that it comes across more of a thriller with a few sexual elements rather than a straight-up shagathon. Mm. But then at the same time, it probably was a conscious decision on Moondra's part because by this point, it had been five years of milking mm. the genre. Mm. And as uh, you know, as Jim Wynorski went on to state, that it soon became apparent that erotics weren't selling like they used to, which is why they ended up having to introduce like horror elements into them with sure. With Wynorski's Sorceress, Fred Alden Ray's Possessed by the Night. They were trying to put more things in there because straight erotic thrillers as the genre was forming, they were either, you know, they were now seen as too tame. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was getting to the point where they needed more stringent softcore, which was less about plotting as irresistible impulses. We send somebody in undercover, a woman posing as a would be fashion model. She follows the same trail as the victims did. With any luck, it'll lead us straight to our killer. Sounds like a real long shot. Look, there are exactly 58 health clubs in this city. The odds of this being a coincidence are... Well, they're big. Let's say maybe I authorize this. Who goes? Me. (laughs) I'm sorry, I have this head cold. I don't think I heard what you just said. I'll go. (laughs) This is a joke, right? Look at me. Sarah's idea. Sarah's case. Look, Sarah, don't take this the wrong way. Okay, fine, take it the wrong way. I think you're a terrific cop, but let's face it, in the looks department, you're not exactly, um, Cindy Crawford. Ten out of ten. Probably isn't the score we'd give this film, but it is the (laughs) tenth film out of ten. So for a second there, we can fall into the illusion that it is worth ten out of ten. Tainted Love. I quite liked it. Oh, uh, uh. (laughs) No, no. No. Oh, so dad jokes are fine, but keep, keep, soft sell is Keep your soft okay. sell out of it. <laughs> um, keep your Dave balls to yourself. Uh, yeah, totally. I liked, I quite like this, but you were less complimentary. Yeah, I think with this you can see that that's it. Mm-hmm. The erotic thrill is over. Yeah. And it's sort of, in a way, this is Mundra coming full circle. Yeah, This is him so. back to the start mm-hmm. with, this is Jigsaw Murders territory this it's uh, again story by Jag Mundra screenplay by the brilliant Matt Rowe and his writing partner George Ferris and this finds in the same serial killer thriller targeting models territory as mm. Jigsaw Murders you know blending a serial killer flick with erotic elements wasn't anything new you know you've we've, we've got Sea of Love Basic Instinct though this was probably more likely designed to cash in on the rental popularity of the likes of Silence of the Lambs and Seven and Copycat and such. And my issue with uh, Tainted Love is that it swings from gritty to light-hearted and silly. If, you know, yeah, that's, that's one of Moondra's hallmarks, as we've mentioned, this, these pendulous mm-hmm. tones. Uh, but when you compare it to the films that preceded it, Sexual Malice, Improper Conduct and Irresistible Impulse, they all had tonal consistency. He kind of sorted himself out and got himself straightened up and thought, okay, this is how you pace a movie, this is how you do this, this and this. But now he's back doing, again, the uh, the Jigsaw Murders shtick, which is all over the place. And, you know, it starts off really strong and really compelling, but it quickly settles into the mediocre... And it just can't. It just doesn't know what it is. Is it a serial killer thriller? Is mm. it a romantic drama? Is it erotica? Is it a bit of light-hearted gym exploitation? <laughs> Meh. Who knows? Yeah, you said about you know the, the films that may have influenced it. Of course, I referenced it before uh, when we were talking about Rick Rossovich and his terrible performance in Cover Me, the Michael mm. Schroeder film. Cover Me, of course, was about a 
a beautiful cop who goes undercover in the steamy world of modelling to catch a serial killer. Uh, but Tainted Love differs from that because it's about a cop who goes undercover in the steamy world of modelling to catch a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> and becomes, you know, I'll tell you what, enmeshed. That's a word I've not used before. Mm, that's enmeshed. a good one. That's a Love good that. one. Using that. And becomes enmeshed in a turret affair with the prime suspect. Here the cop is played by um, Leanne Beeman. Who's and brilliant, and I think. <laughs> oh, she's unbelievable. And the prime suspect is played by Doug Jeffrey. It, it's a dream team. Mm. For me, that's what blinkered me throughout the whole film, and I enjoyed it. Their chemistry is could, off the chart. I could, so watch, I'll give you I could that. watch them yeah. all day. But yeah, you're right. The Anne Beeman is great, especially that first half hour where she's um, she's that butch cop. Yeah, you know, the tomboy stick. Tomboy cop. You know, baseball cap turned around, plaid shirt. Um, Stuck yeah. in a chauvinistic, male-dominated environment. Oh yeah, Sarah Baldwin. They said, you know, pff, Sarah Bulbus. They're more like, <laughs> and she's excellent. She's completely devoted to the job. She likes to tipple, and she likes to um, phone her partner at three a.m. in the morning. Much to the chagrin of his wife. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I, I tell you what, that's one aspect I really liked about it: the sort of platonic friendship. Yeah, between that was good, wasn't uh, it? between Baldwin and her partner, because so often they would go down the route. Of, yeah, you know they've had an affair or something like that. But, but it wasn't. No, just really, they're just two people who respect each other as colleagues and happen to be good friends as well. Mm. I, I thought, if anything, I mean, in a contrast to Leanne's character of Sarah Beeman, I thought Doug Jeffrey's character was a little bit thin. You know, he's not got much to do other than stand around being intense and smoke a cigar in a nice suit. Yeah, he plays Michael Madsen, star of Free Willy. Sorry, Michael Mad <laughs> Michael Madison. Michael Madison, a wealthy fashion designer. And yeah, he's he's a bit he's a bit cardboard yeah. cut out in respect to character. Certainly not in terms of performance, but um, in relation to anything he's got to do, there's a few plus points, you know. Like I, I think uh, it's a little bit basic instinct, isn't it? In, 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 in yeah. Again, it's what gets me. It is how much it copies the jigsaw murders, yeah, right yeah. down to the fact that you know you've got the same eccentric photographer type character in there who here <laughs> played, you know, the here it's this guy called Franz Ritter who's <laughs> given a wildly fluctuating chairman <laughs> oh nine, oh darling like that sort of cartoony mm. accent but I do like the fact that he's played by the late great Ken Stedman who was very very tragically killed at the very frightening, very young age of 27, not Gosh. long after uh, Tainted Love he was killed in a dune buggy accident on the set of an episode of TV series Sliders that he was guesting in. Mm. Uh, he's left behind a canny little legacy, though, that I think it's worth drawing attention to. He'd worked with Greg Dark on Mirror Images 2, Dave Dakota on Beach Babes from Beyond, and Moondra here. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's got a little legacy among uh, proponents of erotica and quality B-movies, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But the film... It's it's very nicely shot. Um, you know, I've I've said it with a lot of Moondra's stuff. It's very slick, very snazzy, and I love, I absolutely love all the steady cam work that yeah. front loads mm -hmm. the film. I think that is fantastic. It was shot by a guy called Blaine Brown, wasn't it? Somebody who we are a big fan of. Big fan of Blaine Brown. This was one of his first gigs. He went on to work for Mystic Films, who we'll get to later on in this podcast uh, series, no doubt, uh, where he directed the excellent, excellent. Uh, Web of Seduction, which is kind of a erotic version of Strangers on a Train, uh, which you can read about on the schlockpit.com. Great film. Uh, but yeah, he's good, and he, he's, he's, he's a decent DP as well. But on the whole, I mean, Tainted Love, it, yeah, well made, amusing at times, steamy enough, like the, yeah. the, the sex scene on the boat, that's, you know, that's nicely Great, done as per, and I, and I, uh, I tell you, I love, <laughs> I love the scene where Baldwin blows her cover. Oh, when, yeah. Uh, when she stops a restaurant from being robbed while out on a date <laughs> with the Madison guy, uh, and she does that by going full Dirty Harry and shooting the fuck out of the <laughs> robbers. I thought that was like a really, really funny and amusing scene. But ultimately, it's, it's, it's a very, very slight movie. It is. And it, it, yeah, it, it just potters along. Yeah. Again, there's a... There's a there's a lack of um, sex compared to the early film. I would yeah. say, you know, I think I think we're about a third in before there's a sex scene. Mm. Um, we would say you know, it's fine, but you know, then we're treated to yacht sex, limo sex, and carpet remnant world sex, <laughs> or certainly some some back room of 
you know, corporate mm. world. But that was it, though, as you say, for Moondry, that his last big sale for this sort of thing was Irresistible Impulse, and then straight after Tainted Love, what he goes on to make a, a fairly standard cop killer thriller, isn't it? Shades, Shades of, of Grey. Grey. Yeah, funny enough, the, one of the leads in Shades of Grey was, was the guy that was shot at the beginning of this film robbing the uh, grocery store. He's the lead in, in, in Shades oh, of Grey. Oh, is it the guy from Lurking Fear and Head of a Family? Yeah. I think what he's, what's, what's he Long blonde hair. Um, um, forget his name. Blake Bailey. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, no, but I must admit, if you had to pick any one of these ten films and have the cover art blown up mm. as, as, a, as a piece of, piece of wall art, what would it be? Because for me, I love the box art of this film. Yeah, that, that it's, shot, very, it's very, very striking. Beeman, yeah. and then you've got Jeffrey just holding that restraint rope mm. in his hand, staring at the camera. Love very that. threatening, yeah. It's very, very cool. Mm. I, I like Irresistible Impulse. I right. think that, that's a sort of... The, the box cover for that is the uh, the things you see in a Spanish hotel's lift. <laughs> I love that. I love that aspect. Of it. Yeah, I wish yeah. I'd, there was more of that. Mm. Yeah, so as per usual, it was distributed on VHS by Your Home Video, who had put out most of the Empire, uh, Empire, wrong podcast, most of the Everest Home Video uh, films to date. And yeah, that, that pretty much wraps it up with a, a bit of a whimper. But mm. nevertheless, I mean... It Jack, seems to be a tradition when we do big, overarching retrospectives yeah, and but, stuff. Yeah, but, but, but Jag Mundra's sort of three-star movies are... <sighs> Very, you're two star on this, aren't you? Yeah, this is this is a two two out of if, again. If you if one is going to be so gauche as to assign <laughs> a star rating, I would go as two out of five. We tainted love. Mm. So the problem is we have discussed ten films that nobody is able to see. Mm-hmm. Although I think, ironically, you can see the worst film of the lot, which is Tropical Heat on on Tubi. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> So if you want and to see on the, stars as well, the worst it was oh, on it? there, yeah. yeah. Ooh. Christ. Don't please yeah, don't you don't do you will that. be put off Mundra for life. Yeah, um, but it's funny. We just hope that one day that this catalogue will somehow find a modern day format because mm. it is very very deserving. A lot of them are very very good as as we've as we've said. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like you can't. I cannot recommend the likes of Last Call, Wild Cactus, uh, Sexual Malice. Mm. Uh, improper conduct, irresistible impulse enough. They are yeah. brilliant, brilliant movies. I and mean, from ten films to have five nigh-on masterpieces, mm. that's a hell of a record. A hundred percent highlights of the erotic thriller genre. Not yeah. just the director video stuff, yeah. but I think for any one of Moondra's best, Wild Cactus could easily stand up alongside Fatal Attraction, mm. Basic Instinct, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Good. It's been fun. Uh, and we'll be back next episode with something a little more digestible. <laughs> yeah. Easily digestible. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening. Thank you. I've been Dave Wayne, and you have been... Jag Mood... Uh, sorry, Matty Budrevich. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to head over to theschlockpit.com. See you next time on Flesh Noir.